All right, in three, and two, and one. Well, we have a second episode of Drugs and Coffee, and uh, today's guest is Matt, um, my good friend from uh, college. Wanted to um, just kind of get your background first, and you know, um, if you can tell us your story, you know, how you started pharmacy school, and um, how um, how did you end up where you are now? Yeah, so. <clears throat> So I was thinking about like way back, um, I was thinking about I really wanted to be, go into chemistry. I at, the, at one point thought I really wanted to be, uh, you know, the head of a lab. Um, I thought that would be really cool. I had a neighbor that was a chemical engineer. And uh-huh. um, so not quite the same thing, but um, I re- actually originally thought I would be a chemical engineer. And um, I got to college and realized I don't think like an engineer, like at all. Like they think really differently and they do things really differently. And so I realized okay. maybe engineering wasn't what I should do. I should go into chemistry. And then, um, so I spent a year in the chemistry department and, um, you know, everyone else in the department was going into pre-med or they were going into some other thing. And, and I was like the lone chemist, uh, thinking that I would be a chemist. And then uh-huh. um, after a year, I met with, I finally met with my academic advisor, uh, which I guess I'm grateful that I met with anybody at all, but he started asking me about going to graduate school. And, um, mm-hmm. and I thought, I don't, I don't really want to go to graduate school. I don't want to be that long in school. And so pretty much like right after that conversation, I'm like, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a chemist anymore. <laughs> I need to do something else. I need to find something else. And so um, and I think the other thing he said is, he said, you know, you're, you seem a little bit more personable. And so are you, do you really want to be in a lab for the rest of your life? And um, I mean, I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't even know what it meant to be a chemist or to be in the lab. So um, you just found like mixing chemicals interesting. I was like, okay, this, I'm going to make something. And yeah, like chemistry and science. And like, so, I mean, it all started for me, it all started with explosions. So you know, I was really, really like, like, what makes things explode? What th- makes things, you know, like, why does that happen? Right. And how do you, how could you make that happen on, you know, like whenever you mm-hmm. wanted? And so I had this great science teacher um, when I was in middle school and we got into this like long conversation about explosions and, and that like anything can explode, like flour can explode if it's the right mix of oxygen and, and uh, Uh particles per million or whatever anyway so um so that was like maybe that's where i wanted to go and you know be able to apply science and um do different things but that's you know it really for me it was all about sort of explosions and you know that chemical engineer friend of mine was a rocket scientist so it's that helps it helps (laughs) right so like his his whole job is like his whole living was about yeah how do you uh, predictably make things explode and explode in the right ways. And so, you know, that was like, uh-huh. for me, that was the background, right? That's how I viewed um, science and chemistry. And so I was, you know, I was kind of excited about it. And then kind of the realities of uh, chemistry, the realities of science, I was like, uh, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not so cut out for this. Um, <laughs> and maybe I need to think about something else, like something other than chemistry and so but then everything got put on hold for a couple of years so I um, served a mission for my church uh, so for two years I lived in Canada and mm-hmm. um, you know in that time I, you know I wasn't thinking about school wasn't thinking about anything else um, but I met a lot of really interesting people and you know met a couple of pharmacists and met a couple other you know a lot of different uh, people with a lot of different professions and and then mm-hmm. eventually um, through that I started to think more seriously about um, pharmacy and um, I mean I'll, like all the hidden secrets of why what motivated me to get into pharmacy partly is this like science but like right before I left for uh, my missionary service I went to visit my my brother in um, Mississippi he was doing some graduate work there mm-hmm. and um, he helped out it was like it was just after graduation and uh, he had helped out with the pharmacy school graduation now this is 
1996 ish okay uh, 1997 okay. So still... yeah so like okay. kind of right when pharmacy positions were taking off right and like i found out yeah. later that's when right rite aid was buying up a bunch of stores walgreens was buying up a bunch of mm -hmm. stores right and so like there was this massive yeah, it was definitely for, heating up then yes yes right people, and so late sal 90s, yeah. right salaries were going crazy and um mm -hmm. that was the time of like the sign-on bonuses and stuff and so he was saying that at this party people were you know getting bmws you know people right. were getting cars <laughs> right, like right. people were like and i was like yeah wait a minute there's a there's a profession <laughs> That when you graduate, they give you a BMW, like not just education and a good salary. You would actually right. get a car. Right. Isn't it yes, like, it's yes. like the Price is Right or something. Like, and here's it's your the new unicorn car. of unicorn of, uh, of 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 jobs, right? Right, exactly. And uh, so you know, I, I mean, I I it's I, I wouldn't say that that was like top of my mind, but that was certainly right. in my mind. And so mm -hmm. when I was thinking about jobs. Um, uh, you know, I was thinking about pharmacy and just kind of mulling it over. Maybe that would be different. Maybe that would be better. But funnily enough, I met this pharmacist. This is like really late in my two years in Canada. I met this pharmacist in Calgary and he's, he said, uh, you know, like, what do you want to do with your life? And so I was like, I don't know. I was thinking, I was thinking about pharmacy actually. And he's like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm a pharmacist. He's like, don't get into pharmacy. It's terrible. <laughs> it's awful. If you have any ideas of like going into medicine, go into medicine, become a doctor, don't do uh -huh. pharmacy. And I was like, ah, oh, it's like a really strange thing to say, like a pharmacist that like hates his profession. <laughs> but I, I kind of felt like that's where I needed to be. So um, anyway, so when I got done with um, Canada, uh, I moved back and started at the University of Utah because they had a pharmacy program. And so I mm -hmm. thought, you know, that's where I was going to be. And um, uh, I started work. I tried to get a job anywhere. I got a job at a Rite Aid um, that was downtown. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me do uh, real pharmacy work. I had to be a clerk. So, uh, but it let me put on my resume that I, I, I was a pharmacy clerk, which was like a, you know, a way to right. game the system a little bit, but that let me, um, I applied for other jobs uh, and I applied at the University of Utah pharmacy department. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I got a call back a year after I'd, I'd, I was working at Rite Aid. And the reason they called me is because they said I had pharmacy experience. And they said, we, right. you're the only one in the, yeah. our applicant pool currently with pharmacy experience. I had to come clean a little bit. I'm like, well, you know, well. <laughs> pharmacy experience in that I, you know, I put away stuff on the shelf. And they're like, no, 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 that's good enough. That's good enough. Like, that's right. more than anybody else. So I worked at you've the... Seen, you, were on the, you were on the other side of, of the counter. So right. That, that, yes, you, you've seen the other side. So that's good. <laughs> right. The mystery behind the, the counter. So, right. yeah, so, so I did that for um, another year at the University of Utah Hospital Pharmacy and, and learned a lot, actually. I mean, I made all the mistakes in the world and uh, it was really funny because I kept thinking, I'm, you know, I'm doing this work, but I really don't know anything, right? I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know what Tylenol does. That was before I knew no one really knows what Tylenol does. I, I didn't know <laughs> what, you know, I didn't know anything about anything. And, and uh, right. but here I was, I was like mixing drugs and uh, mixing sterile compounds and uh, they were they were really you know they were very nice about letting uh, and training me to do all sorts of different things. I did end up spending a lot of time in the IV room, and uh, so then I. Oh, that's that's cool. I mean, that's back in, before, I mean that that's the early IV rooms, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean it still was a clean room. I mean right. there's I mean I've got a lot of stories. I I will not like I don't know the statute of limitations has run out on all the. <laughs> but like so i mean there's a lot of like uh you know a lot of yeah, stories from the iv room but yes um maybe for another podcast there's another reason to have me on later um but anyway right. the um so i was in the iv room and like and i i really do think i learned a lot of really good things they were doing a lot of progressive things they were doing like um uh, validation testing in uh chemotherapy hood uh vertical oh, wow. hood with uh, fluorescent light so, oh, wow. you know, they were using uh, fluorescent uh, liquids and then shining a black light and seeing if, if it was coming out. And actually what I did. Wow, that's, 
<laughs> that's 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 early night. I mean, that's late nineties, right? That's yeah. That's I mean, late. That, well, that was about two thousand. Yeah, ninety nine, ninety nine, and two thousand. So. Oh wow. And what I didn't realize is that that work that was happening there. Um, uh, Jim Jorgensen was the director of pharmacy at the time, and mm -hmm. um, he was doing uh, research on the first closed system transfer devices. So. Um, to, so to now, really the fast next. forward 20 years, we're, we, we're <laughs> yeah. USB 100, right? <laughs> right, yeah. And then fast forward 20 years, and now it's the standard that they kind of have to be used everywhere. And it's right. largely due to Jim's research that he did at the University mm -hmm. of Utah with, um, yeah, I can't remember what the uh, company is. I'm blanking on the company. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, so, um, so then I... Uh, got into pharmacy school, but I was really, uh, I was applying, I really thought that I was going to go to the University of Utah pharmacy school. And uh, I was really hoping for that because it was, it was really cheap to go there. <laughs> like, you know, back in the day, that was $7,000 a year. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. And as you know, the University of Sciences was not $7,000. Not, not, definitely not 7000 a year. <laughs> yeah. So, maybe for, for a week. Yes, yeah. Maybe. Right. Right. <laughs> Not even a semester. That was not even close to a semester. That was less oh, wow. than half a semester. Anyway, so, um, uh, so yeah, I, I thought I was really headed there. And then it just kind of came down to some numbers. Also, in their requirements, they required, you know, a whole load of different classes. And one of them was cell biology. And so I, um, I had, I was able to load up my schedule for everything except for cell biology. And so I, um, I asked them at the application office, like, can I, can I apply? And then I'll just take cell biology in the summer. And they said, no, you have to have everything done when you turn in your application. And, uh, and I was like, oh, okay. So I kind of thought I had a full year to, to hopefully finish my chemistry degree and uh -huh. take cell biology. But, um, but then I started to look at other pharmacy schools all over the country. And really what I was hoping for are pharmacy schools that focused on hospital pharmacy, because that's, that's where I felt like I fit. Like I, I didn't really think I fit that well in a retail pharmacy, mm -hmm. but I really right. felt like I found a home in uh, uh, the hospital pharmacy. And mm -hmm. so I uh, 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 was looking at all these other different pharmacy schools and, um, and, and writing down their requirements. So they all had different requirements you know, microeconomics or macroeconomics or zoology was one I remember. And oh, wow. so I was trying to correlate all of them, like how many of these classes could I take in so I'd be ready to apply to these other pharmacy schools. And I called up uh, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, got their requirements, and they were exactly the same as the University of Utah. Um, and the, the, so the only thing I was missing was cell biology. <laughs> and I was like, ah, cell biology. And uh, <laughs> the person on the phone said, yeah, but that's fine. You can take it in the summer. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. Like I could yeah. take it. So I turned in my application thinking, you know, really I was still going to be in Utah for a year and I might apply. And then, you know, out of nowhere, I got, I got in at the, mm -hmm. at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. So, um, you know, I figured getting into pharmacy school, even though it meant kind of getting a lot of debt, um, was going to be better than waiting on the possible chance of getting into pharmacy school like I you know who knows what can happen in a year so so I decided to take the sure thing and uh, move to Philadelphia yeah. yeah I mean that that makes sense I mean it definitely and then fast forward uh, now you're yeah you, know, you see they paid off so right um, yeah and that's really like that move to Philadelphia set up so many things and just I'll just run through quickly like that series of events like going to Philadelphia um, I didn't work for a full year. Uh, I applied to a lot of different places and didn't get any job callbacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I met um, a, one of the professors at uh, uh, Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, Steve Schaefer. Like forever, I will say Steve Schaefer has changed my career um, because he he asked me like why I wasn't working, and I kind of explained the story that no one <laughs> no one called me back, <laughs> and uh, and he said, well, let me let me make a few phone calls, and so and he invited me to a thing with. Um, Michael Cohen at the Institute of the ISMP, Institute of Safe mm. Medication Practices, oh, he wow. was giving a, a speech at the college. 
So I okay. went there and yeah, Steve, right there. yeah, Steve introduced me to uh, all the directors of pharmacy in Philadelphia. And mm. so in two weeks I had offers from every hospital pharmacy in Philadelphia for an uh, internship. So, so you started with no phone calls to, you know, tons of phone calls, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, right. And like being I mean, able you're to... You're right, Steve. I mean, yeah, Steve Schaefer did change your yeah. career pretty much. I mean, just that one move. Yeah, that, uh, that, that one sense. introduction changed. changed mm -hmm. So that led me to uh, Thomas Jefferson. And then Steve told me about an internship at Johns Hopkins. So I, I applied mm -hmm. and, you know, got the uh, internship there, which led me to meet so many different people and uh and then you know in conversation with someone else that he knew that was in south carolina got kind of steered towards my um uh, residency in uh leadership so so you did the residency at musc or yeah, at medical university uh, of south carolina with paul bush who's now the uh, okay. president of well just he finally finished up all of his service but a uh, president mm -hmm. of ashp Oh, okay. Okay. So uh, how long was the residency? Did two, you do a year or two, two years, two years. Two so years. the first year was focused on clinical work. And then the second year was all management and leadership work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that that first year was um, unremarkable. I, I, I survived, you know, and all the patients <laughs> survived. That's the <laughs> that's the benefit. Um, okay. All the ones that could survive survived, and um, so clean, yeah. clean record there. Clean record, That's good. Clean record in my uh, clinical work, um, okay. and then in the second year, um, they were switching out their electronic medical record and said, you know, do you want to take over this project? And mm -hmm. um, and really, it was very narrow though. It was just our, our implementation day, so I I uh, organized all the work to to switch out. Um, and all the staffing requirements, organized all the staff, led the staff through that process and the switch out day and the ensuing couple weeks. So let me stop. Are yeah. you a um, computer savvy person? Like, do you call yourself? I mean, do actually, let me put it this way. Do people come to you to ask you for help? Um, you know what's about computers? funny? They come to my wife. <laughs> Oh really? <laughs> they come to my wife more than they come to me. Maybe she's more approachable, but I, I would just, now I would just you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I, I was trying to, I'm kind of, I was getting a sense of, you know, you're implementing this, and then, you know, further down the road, there's telepharmacy, I'm like, this guy might be, uh, okay. So. I, I definitely have a tech interest. So I would say that I'm a, how do I put it? I'm an expert novice. Okay. So I... Just I, enough to be dangerous. Yeah, exactly. Right. Just enough to be, okay. just enough to sort of know what's happening in the conversation. But when it gets okay. too deep... I have no idea. Like I can't program anything. I can't, um, like I can't run a SQL report. I do know what a SQL report is, but okay. I couldn't write one and I couldn't run one. Um, okay. You just, yeah, okay. Yeah. I understand. I mean, that that's pretty much what all you need really. Yeah, right. It's just, you know, because these days you can't get too deep into it. Yeah, these days, well, you, you know, can. and the lesson that I learned in my residency is like, you know, you don't really get things done yourself. You get things done because you know people who can get things done and you can organize people mm -hmm. that can get things done. So, you know, too much of that, like I know how to do these things kind of is a bad trait in a leader. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, oh, yeah. not advocating incompetence. I'm just saying like, it, you know, you really do need a team in well, order to get anything sizable done. And so if you just learn early that you've, you've got to be able to well, organize I mean, those people. I mean, just recognizing what people are good at. I mean, just what their strengths are. I mean, your team and just figuring out what they know. Right. So if you have somebody who enjoys computers, you just, hey. And, and you know, that's, that is, I agree. I mean, that's 100% true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I was at MUSC for seven years total. So two years of residency. And then um, mm -hmm. in the last part of my second year, um, so I like did that implementation that went well. And then they, they were like, okay, well, what's your next project? And, uh, and I said, you know, I don't really know. And they said, you know, the children's hospital has been without a permanent leader for about two years and they're really struggling. What about mm -hmm. taking over as the manager of the children's hospital as a residency project? 
And oh, wow. so it was like, residency project. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I was the chief, res one of the chief residents for our class. And, um, so there's a lot going on and I, 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 so I said, yes, I kind of bit off more than I could chew. It was a big, it was a lot of work. Um, they had a lot of things that needed to get fixed. There were a lot of issues, but you know, I'd been working there for six months at that point and had sort of seen where things needed to get improved and what things needed to happen in order to stabilize it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they said, uh, you know, Paul said, if you take it over, um, you know, we'll work everything out and we'll make sure that it happens and, you know, we'll support you. And um, it was a lot, it was really hard, uh, but I took that over and then in a couple months applied for the full-time position and got the full-time position after mm -hmm. my residency ended. But I was one of the few that, you know, did a residency and ended my residency on uh, June 30th and July, uh, sorry, July 31st, no, June 30th and July 1st, um, mm -hmm. I was working. Uh, so oh, wow. there was no time off. Um, I just, because, because so you, there you were just continued. Yeah, I just continued, really... right. Just continued. Right. And, um, cause there were a lot of issues. And so we were kind of in the middle of a big revamp of the pharmacy and it just took mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of effort. And I, really I mean, that's a good experience. You know, I mean, I've had some, some of that in my career where you kind of run into a kind of a mess essentially, but as an experience that, I mean, you can't get that. I mean, you can't replicate that. And it, you know, the, the things you learn yeah. in that short time or whatever the time is, I mean, you can't replicate that. You, nobody can teach you that. Right. So, so yeah, I that, had, that's a, it's, that's a good thing. It is a good thing. I mean, did you, so I'm interested on your side of the equation. Did you uh -huh. like, while you were in it, did you recognize that it was a good experience? No, no. I mean, yeah. I kind of, you know, you kind of get asked to, hey, can you do this? I'm like, I, I mean, I can try, you know, right. I, I know what, what it needs to be, you know, and I, I know how it needs to look, um, you know, but it's, you know, you don't know the steps, you don't know how you're going to get there, really. Yeah. And then once you're done, once you're done, once you see the product, you kind of say, okay, um, this is really, really useful. I mean, what, and then to this day, I mean, someone, I, I mean, I, without kind of going too much into details, um, you know, I've taken pictures and things and I kind of saved some material from it yeah. as a teaching tool. And now when I train pharmacists and techs, that is a must, you know, I have to show them and kind of tell them, okay, this is what is not supposed to be, right. or this is how it was, you know, kind of give them the more in depth knowledge. And it really helps yeah. you know, versus kind of learning from policies and procedures. And sometimes, you know, you know, people perceive me as okay, this guy again, you know, with his, you know, <laughs> teaching, but um, I think that's important. You know, in general, it's important to teach people based on your experience, not, yeah. you know, hey, here's the policy and procedure. Read it, you know, tell me what you think and what, you, what you've what you learned and let's move on. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, what I've noticed. And that's the th the reason I ask is, you know, when I, because I've talked to, I've been involved with residency programs and, you know, other, um, you know, teaching folks mm -hmm. and teaching pharmacists that I work with for my whole career. Um, and what I've noticed is it's, it's really hard to teach leadership because I don't, you know, I don't remember learning leadership from a book. I learned, I learned it by getting into really difficult situations <laughs> and then sort of, you know, working my way out of those. And so right. sometimes I find it hard, like, and, and also I find like, um, sometimes we have a big discussion about, is this too hard for somebody? And like, I'm always the one in the room that's like, it might be, but like, maybe they need that. Like, maybe that's, maybe no, that's the thing hurts. that they're going to, right. They're going to really grow the most because we gave them something that was kind of mm -hmm. beyond what they were capable of. Yeah. I mean, and what's, what's the opposite? I mean, opposite is I give you something easy and you know, nobody benefits really. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. I agree. I, I'm. I completely agree with you. I mean, 
like keeping you know management for me it's kind of just keeping people and you know the process just a little bit uncomfortable you know that <laughs> just kind of just you know it's like a shoes that don't really fit but you like them and it's kind of but you know eventually you kind of you know they fit you you know they, they fit you right because you walked long enough you know yeah. You know that that's how I see it, really. Um, yeah, but um, so yeah. I mean that that seems like a really good experience. I mean you kind of got to um, experience a lot in a short period of time. Yeah. And um, yeah. It was, so that yeah. that's um, that's at still at MUSC. Yeah. So that was two. I mean, it really took about two years to get sort of solidified there, and then you know, mm -hmm. I I did some projects there, and then. You know, I was really kind of looking for more and looking for what I could do to take the next step. I ended up um, looking for and finding a, an open position at the at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. They were looking for their first director of pharmacy, specifically for mm -hmm. the children's hospital. Okay. And so I got um, through the interview process and got selected for that. So I was, um, and that was uh, a really great experience because that was um, the location where um, a, a very famous medication safety case, the Emily Jerry event happened where, you know, a three-year-old was given incorrect medication, um, incorrect chemotherapy in it, and it unfortunately killed her. And mm -hmm. what came of that, though, was um, a real deep dive, a real serious dive into medication safety at children's hospitals across um, several campuses uh, and across the country. And um, from that effort, the Ohio Children's Hospitals, because there's eight uh, Ohio Children's Hospitals, came together as a collaborative with Rainbow kind of leading a lot of that effort and um, University of Cincinnati. And so they came together to form this massive patient safety collaborative. So when I, when I took over, um, you know, almost a part of my interview process was talk, to talk with the father, um, Chris Jerry of Emily Jerry and to like think through what's my patient safety philosophy? How do I, how do okay. we do things? Uh -huh. Like how do I do things and how do we think about um, organizing a pharmacy? And so um, I actually spent a lot of time with Chris um, over the course of my time there and um, not necessarily bouncing ideas off of him, but, but getting a different perspective on how we were doing things, why we were doing things and um, just talking through, sort of the projects and and what projects we are prioritizing and how we are moving through i've never work. heard of i've never heard of that kind of situation where you would bring you know bring you know bring up a father of a of somebody who who got hurt or something like that i mean that, that that's that's pretty deep it's really just um it, kind of, it, it, it gives you it gives you a different perspective i mean yeah it really does yeah, it really connects, it connects things differently, right? And I mm -hmm. think that, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't to ask his permission for anything, because he didn't really want to give permission. He just wanted to know that things were going to get better, right? And he wanted mm -hmm. to know that we were really serious about what we were doing and, and that we were going to take things as, you know, as far as we could go. And the stated okay. purpose of the hospital is to get to zero harm events. And uh, mm -hmm. so I really credit that organization with teaching me in a very real way, all of the methodology mm -hmm. and the science behind patient safety and being able to really go deeper into what that looks like, how that looks. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. Um, one of the challenges though uh, was, you know, going back to going to the Philadelphia college of pharmacy and taking out a, quite a bit of debt, and then um, being in South Carolina, and we were there during the housing crunch. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> and so when we moved to Cleveland, uh -huh. um, we couldn't sell our house. And so we had this house in South mm -hmm. Carolina that we were paying on. We were able to get some renters, but um, but then we were paying, you know, paying rent yeah, in yeah. Cleveland. And so it was a financial crunch. And mm -hmm. um, one day I got this phone call from a recruiter and they said, you know, they're building this children's hospital in Qatar in the Middle East. And I didn't, I mean, I had heard 
of Qatar before, but I didn't really, I couldn't tell you where it was on the map. Um, and they said uh, I'm it has. Dying to hear this because I am dying to this to hear this part of the story <laughs> yeah. because this is probably <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they yeah. so they uh -huh. they said it's uh, it's got eight. It has an eight billion dollar endowment, and mm -hmm. like at that time in Cleveland, we were going through budget cuts, and so <laughs> like I was spending hours and hours going through our budget. Like, how do we cut this? How do we cut that? You know, we want to build this, but we can't. And and so uh, my conversation with them was really different. And I remember thinking, you know, what if, what if a hundred percent of my time was spent creatively solving problems, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, maybe getting twenty percent of my time doing that, and the other eighty percent is dealing with, you know, all mm -hmm. these things that are broken, and then budget cuts, and right. you know, trying to squeeze another nickel out of the system. And um, I don't know, that was really what was attractive to me is if I could spend, you know, 100% of my time creatively solving problems and also to build a department from scratch. They did not have a department of pharmacy. It didn't exist. There were, I was the third employee, I think, that was hired there. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so it was, was, it was. Was there even a hospital when you got there? Yeah, ish. So, the, ish. yeah, okay. yeah, they were building it. And so, okay. but it was really, it was really a unique situation. Uh, see, unique, I don't know. I don't know that it's unique for the area, but it was unique to me, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, an entity, which was the, um, the royals in Qatar, mm -hmm. the royal family. They were going to build this hospital, right? And spend how many ever billion dollars that it was going to take to build the actual facility. And they had this endowment that was over here that was supposed to help run the hospital once it got up and running. And mm -hmm. the idea was that they would then, when it was completed, the hospital, they would gift it to the this entity, right, that they had created with the $8 billion endowment. Mm -hmm. And so that seems like on the surface like a great thing, right? The mm -hmm. challenge when I got there is I was like, great, I want to go see the hospital. They're like, you can't because it's not yours it's this other entities and I'm like okay but how do I know that it's right and like well you you just have to trust us that it's going to be right and I'm like no that goes against every fiber of my being like I, it, I I don't trust anyone about anything like I learned very early on in operations don't trust anybody about anything like go mm -hmm. put your eyes on it so so I finally got there and I looked at it and there were you know significant issues in the design um, and the production of the sterile uh, areas and some of the other mm -hmm. functionality. And so, so the knowledge was not there. I mean, they, right. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so they just really didn't have the, they didn't have the background and they didn't have the person that was leading the group before. I don't think had the background, certainly not in pediatrics, but also not really a good fundamental background in standards, why we have them why they work, how they work. Um, so anyway, so I spent a lot of time actually arguing back and forth and trying to get these things right. And then, you know, it was it was really odd. They would say things like, you know, we are opening this hospital on January 12th. And this is like, this is like November. Like we are mm -hmm. opening the hospital on January 12th. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we don't have a pharmacy department. Like, yeah, but it's gonna open. So like your job is to go go recruit all the people that we need and uh, like, how many people do you need? And I'm like, well, it's a 400 bed hospital, women's and children's, you know, that has this kind of setup, like probably 200 people is what we came out. And there was a lot more methodology and they're like, you can't right. have that many. And so anyways, just all these constant, like back and forth of like, well, you're not going to let me hire anybody, but you, you say you're going to open. So, so you had this like, okay, so they have the funds, but then you have all this red tape. So essentially, right you can smell the, the funds and you know the unlimited <laughs> potential unlimited budget but you can't really use it <laughs> right right and they'd say versus things, <laughs> right yeah they'd say things like well we we bought we bought this uh, Riva this automated you know this robot that will make all the IVs you don't have to have anybody doing IVs I'm like yeah but what are all the things that the robot can't make which even if it's 10 percent of the which by the way it's a lot more than 10 percent you know, you still mm -hmm. have to have somebody there doing it. And who's going to manage the machine? Manage. 
Right. You're like, oh, clean the machine. <laughs> it's just a robot. It does. It does. And so there was right. a lot of misperception about where automation, what automation could do. So how long were you there? Do. I was there for two and a half years. Okay. Was that a contract? And you, you, it wasn't. You so gonna, it was an open-ended contract. You wanted contract. to kind of see. Yeah, yeah, it was an open-ended contract. I would have been there for a lot longer, but um, uh, around, I mean, six months before I uh, was laid off, because I, mean, I was laid off, there were mm -hmm. the, the oil market tanked. So, oh, okay. um, you know, that $8 billion of endowment, suddenly it didn't evaporate, but it was like, well, we don't know how this is going to be sustainable. We don't know how this project mm -hmm. is going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of worry about that as we watched the oil prices go down and down and down. So I actually found myself every morning, I'd come into work, I'd check the oil price, I'm like, oh, oh wow. we're still going to have problems. And so that's, so that's the reality out. there. I mean, that's right. essentially there. Um, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that's really where where the money is for them. Yeah. So, so, so do you. So then, after that episode, you're back in U.S. So I was back right? in the U.S. So I got laid off, and um, I I went back, came back to the U.S. It took me about six months. As soon as I found out that I was going to be laid off, I I went on and looked for positions. Um, mm -hmm. I was really hoping to stay in pediatrics because that's kind of been my home. Um, I've had, you know, several uh, job offers in adult hospitals throughout the years, but they never really seemed right. Never seemed right. Didn't seem to fit. Um, mm -hmm. But it didn't matter if it didn't fit at this point. Like I needed a job. My I had, you know, I have two boys. They needed food. <laughs> I needed a right. place yes, to live that yes. wasn't my parents' basement. So I was like looking for these jobs and um, I got connected with somebody uh, here at Dartmouth and uh, they were looking for a position. It's funnily though, I applied for a position. Um, it was like a director of system operations and, and the guy I interviewed with said, you know, I think you could do the job and you could do it well, but I have somebody already for that. So would you consider the director of system director of clinical uh, work? And I was like, sure. Yeah. Okay. Like, I need a job like I'll sure I'll do that mm -hmm. and or at least like entertain that idea and then mm -hmm. um, so I went down that road uh, for a little while and then he said you know actually what just came up is this director of telepharmacy and I'm like well I don't know anything about that but when I interviewed for it and I started to look into it a little bit more it was really entrepreneurial it was uh, this group that basically had just formed um, mm -hmm. they didn't have anyone to run it no one really understood how it should work or mm -hmm. um, all the mechanics of the group. And so they said, you can do whatever you want with it. You can. Now, what what year was this? That was 2013. No, no, no. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, no. 2016. 2016 16, is when okay. I came here. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I, I took over this group. It had, I think, five at the time hospitals that they were serving, uh, four pharmacists and mm -hmm. um, a program manager. And they basically said, like, make it work. And so mm -hmm. I've spent, you know, the last three years growing the service from uh, five to we have 19 now. And by the years, by the fiscal, like a year from now, we expect to be somewhere around 23 to 25 hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. We were nowhere close to profitable when I started and we are now finally profitable so so before we kind of dig more in deeper in there I just want to clarify because you know I know some people including me I mean, I'm not really familiar with telepharmacy um, te you know you hear telemedicine telepharmacy internet pharmacies so yeah. this is this is different right this is just want to make that distinction between um yeah what's the internet pharmacy like right. these not to see probably commercials about this roman and all this um, generic rebranded medicine that's being right. you know um prescribed online essentially but this is different this is um a service that pharmacy provides to hospitals and in some cases rural areas right yeah yeah so that's and that's a really good point so when people say telepharmacy, they kind of, 
I mean, everyone conjures up a different picture in their in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I put it into three big buckets. And I'm sure there's more distinctions, but there's sort of the specialty pharmacy area, which is we've got this patient population on these specific medications that need monitoring. And so we're going to remotely manage them, right? We're going to call them. We're going to check in on them. We're going to make sure that they're achieving the outcomes that we hope they'll achieve. I, I put that under sort of the specialty pharmacy bucket. Mm -hmm. Then there's the ambulatory care bucket, which is um, more chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, anticoagulation. And we're going to monitor those patients. And there might be a physical clinic, but we're also going to do quite a bit of that remotely. So we're going to call them, we're going to figure out what's going on and, and interact with them. Uh, we might go through their profile and decide that we need uh, their medication list and decide that we need um, different medications and we'll, we'll have a relationship with a, a pharmacy that they can get that through. And that, that to me is sort of like ambulatory care. And okay. then there's the bucket of inpatient care. And that's the bucket that this really got started in. And the, the premise is, um, and the, the easiest thing to wrap your mind around, uh, but then I'm gonna expand what that vision is. The easiest thing to wrap your mind around is a 25 bed critical access hospital in rural America. And there's a lot of them. There's a mm -hmm. lot of these hospitals. Well, it, it is, a pharmacist is way too expensive to have on 24 hours a day, just because of the volume of work that happens. Not the importance of the work, just the volume of the work. So you can't afford the, you know, two FTE that it's gonna to take to run overnight services. And, mm -hmm. and what we find that break point is, is around 120 to 150 beds, somewhere in there, you start to get to the break point, like half of the population of that size hospital will have overnight pharmacists and half won't. Okay. So, so really telepharmacy is saying, well, well, if it's, it's not profitable or not cost effective for you to have a pharmacist, but if we were to take many of these together and group mm -hmm. them together, um, we could, you know, it's cheaper for you and we could make a small profit. We could make a profit out of that. So you give them flexibility. Yeah. Um, well, we give them the capacity to have prospective order review because the alternative is that they go to when they close the pharmacy and then nurses just act on orders that physicians write. And we know, mm -hmm. I mean, we know because of the last 50 years of medicine that physicians make errors that nurses don't catch. It's not every time, but it's two to 3% of the orders that they'll write are not correct. And two to 3% mm -hmm. of those not correct orders will not be caught. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you just look at the numbers and that means that a critical access hospital working out those numbers is somewhere on the order of, you know, 100 to 200 medication errors uh, a year. And so what percent of those are gonna be serious, right? Right, yeah. So it's all a statistics game, basically, a probability game. Um, is is one way to look at medication mm -hmm. safety. And so by having a prospective pharmacy review, you can invest, let's say, a quarter of the cost of a pharmacist and actually get that safety and add one more, you know, one more layer of, of safety, which should bring your, your potential medication errors down basically on a logarithmic scale. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I haven't, I've never worked in a hospital, but I can assume with night shifts, I mean, that's exactly when yep. your your risk is. I mean, your, your highest risk, you know, just because, you know, at night shift, your attention goes down and you're just not able to focus as much. So, um, so if that nurse is you know, <laughs> coming off a long shift and she's working night shift, she's not going to catch her the doctor. So yeah, it, it does make sense to bring an extra layer. Yeah. And so um, we say we can do that for a re a reasonable cost, right? So if it's, it's about a quarter to, I mean, at the, it depends on the size of the hospital, but a quarter to mm -hmm. half the cost of a pharmacist. So, okay. so in that regard, it's, it's really helpful. But what we, what I did when I got here is I started to look at it and think, you know, 
but if that's the value, why wouldn't we think of that in other ways? Like there's, there's any number of projects that just don't get done because you don't have people to do it. So what if we could mm-hmm. provide a way that that work that's not super high touch, you know, it's not the top of your license to do order entry review. What if we could mm-hmm. do that piece for as cheaply as possible and then essentially fund with the you know, people that are already on site this work that's that is the highest level that you can possibly do. So what we've been doing is working with other working with these hospitals to come mm-hmm. in and help them during the daytime and then they allow their pharmacists on site to start a diabetes clinic or an anti-coag clinic or work on mm-hmm. that uh, IT okay. project that you know was just struggling to get done. Mm-hmm. So we're seeing we're seeing a lot of movement on being able to take a portion of the work and do that as efficiently as possible and use the resources that are on site in the mo- and leverage those resources to as high high potential and 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 the greatest value it's, to the organization so this is very interesting you know my t- first episode was amina and she did talk um about um she talked about co- you know, just physicians and pharmacists working together in general. So yeah. this whole notion of people working in silos. Yeah. Um, and that really kind of stuck with me because it is very true because you have, you know, this is my position. This is what I do. I'm not going to, you know, I own this and that's it. Versus kind of having this more fluid model where we all can contribute different, you know, you know depending on where the strengths are yeah so um it it kind of sounds that's where you kind of headed with this where yeah hey you know i'm, I'm gonna help you here and you go do this other thing um i'm gonna free you up so you can do some clinical work yeah um so right like now right now we're getting so there's it's interesting because we're i feel like we're sort of on the cusp i, I mean i firmly believe that in the next even five years, when we, when we talk about what's going to happen in 2024, 2025, you know, five, six years from now, mm-hmm. a huge portion of work will be done remotely. So mm-hmm. we'll have leverage, we'll finally have decided that being inside the same brick building is meaningless. Mm-hmm. It is, there's no, there's not enough value there in order to mm-hmm. to to warrant what needs to get done so we'll we'll finally realize that you know we can leverage now this infrastructure which is the internet that has been built up over the last two decades you mm-hmm. know we'll be able to leverage that infrastructure for what it kind of was built for which is to really create work and value out of um, remote workforce so you know, yeah. I, I think. I mean, do you? Um, I mean, right now, your your group, I mean, your team, you're working with an inpatient, correct? Yeah. I mean, that's that's your focus. So, um, and I know just from kind of reading about um, telepharmacy, they do a lot of. they you know, clearly there's need to do some rural and just kind of direct patient care. Um, is that something that you think it's growing? It's coming, or what's the? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that's that's where what we're talking about in my group, because there is an ambulatory care group mm-hmm. at Dartmouth and there is a specialty pharmacy group at Dartmouth. Mm-hmm. And so we've been talking really for the last couple of years of how do we blend those things? You know, if you think of them as a Venn diagram, you know, mm-hmm. we've each kind of been staying outside of each other's buckets, but really we, we shouldn't, right? We should blend what that is more and because there is overlap and we should be thinking more about how does what my work does that how does that influence your work when we think of transitions of care how does my work influence the ambulatory mm-hmm. care work but there is a lot of direct patient care opportunity and that's the so the challenge that i have is just figuring out how can i do that what's the workforce that i need in order to do that and how do i maximize people's talent and also make them as efficient as possible, right? So like, mm-hmm. what's the right way of doing this? Is it, is it most efficient to say, we're gonna specialize down, down pieces of work 
And we're going to split those pieces of work up into potentially infinite amounts. And, but we're going to have really efficient each of those. And, and, and we won't lose if we can, if we don't lose fidelity essentially across all of those people, then that's fine. Right. But I, you, but you do lose fidelity. And so that's mm -hmm. the challenge of how, how specialized can you make it so that people know exactly what they're doing and they can get through that work in, a, in an efficient way. But we're, we're experimenting with, and this is already happening at some places in the country. Yale is doing a little bit of this where mm -hmm. they're remotely reviewing IV um, medications that are being prepared. Right. So, you know, there's no reason with current technology, there's no reason why a pharmacist has to be in the same building to verify a, an IV sterile preparation or a chemotherapy preparation. There's no reason. There's no right. reason medication reconciliation has to be done by anybody in the same building. So we're, we have a pilot that we're going to start with a hospital where we're going to do medication reconciliation with an iPad. And all of my pharmacists, by the way, live up and down the East Coast. And we didn't plan it necessarily that way. It just kind of happened that way. But we have pharmacists from Florida all the way to Maine. And so, oh, okay. you know, 100% well, of yeah, that's right. They, they don't have to be there. So, yeah. Well, this is, yeah. This, I say this all the time, you know, whether it's Dubuque or Dubai, it doesn't really mm -hmm. matter, right? As long as there's mm -hmm. an internet connection and we can assure that internet connection, we can do anything with, with voice over internet protocol. So, you know, you can have mm -hmm. a phone call anywhere in the world and it sounds exactly like this. By the way, because of my time in the Middle East, I have phone calls with people that live <laughs> all over the world. I've had phone calls in the Philippines with people that are in Dubai, in Saudi. And I mean, I've had phone calls with people everywhere and it's exactly right. just sounds like this. So yeah, there really is no reason why I, there's not really a barrier. What intrigues me is the whole, you know, the connected devices and, you know, the, the, everybody, you know, with the you know, Apple iWatch and yeah. just a million different things now and that you can see across the retail you know, stores. I mean, all the pharmacies now, pharmacies now are pushing that and more and more people are getting connected. So you have the smart devices that yeah. are just collecting data. Right. Um, who is going to look at the data? Yeah, you know, to and what end? To me, you know, you know, when you go back to the farm, you know, our education, pharmacy school, it always stuck with me. If you're gonna, if you're gonna measure something, if you're gonna order a lab, yeah, know what you're gonna do with that the result. Right. I mean, don't just like okay, just have a number on a piece of paper. So, right. collecting all this data from patients is fine, but you know. Who's gonna sort through this? Yeah. I mean, I guess artificial intelligence at some point. Um, that's gonna happen, I guess. But, uh, um, so, so funnily, last week I sat down with the um, one of the guys in the artificial intelligence lab here at Dartmouth, uh -huh. and um, I was talking to him about this. Like, I was talking to him about big data. I was talk talking to him about how do we create uh, AI so that it can sort through this. And I mean, it's a really, it's a really hard project right it's a really challenging question because it gets back to the heart of like what are we looking for is there exactly is there an outcome a specific outcome that we're looking for or are we in search of a problem right are we using ai and big data to find the problem or are mm -hmm. we trying to find a solution and those two things you structure your database or your your query differently and you'll probably come up with very different answers um, mm -hmm. you know, by approaching it both of those ways. So, and it's so new that really it doesn't matter, right? You can set it up either way and come up with an answer. Well, to me, it's also training the new, I mean, training the pharmacist and training clinicians to understand what you're seeing. You know, if you just, okay, you're going to see somebody's um, download from um, blood pressure or blood glucose machine. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing? And uh, just kind of being able to understand uh, the new technology. Yeah. Um, I don't know if 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 the humans are <laughs> gonna necessarily be able to follow the technology. That's that's the part um, that I'm kind of intrigued to find out because. Um, but I guess we're just gonna keep going. 
I, I try to kind of understand, you know, in my little world, try to make things more efficient. And you're trying to, okay, why are we doing this? Just keep questioning why, why, why. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very interesting topic. I mean, you can probably have a whole different episode on yeah. just that. So. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that's episode 21 or whatever you've got. But yeah, yes. I think that's, that's a, I mean, and I, I think that might be an interesting one to bring on maybe, you know, a couple people and have some sort of round table, but it's, you know, the, the, it is, it is a question of what are we really hoping to get done? Like what, what's the, what's the question that we're hoping to answer? I mean, we, and, and actually, I don't think that there's, I mean, I don't know, I need to check the literature on this, but it seems like we don't really have great literature yet on, Mm -hmm. you know, like, like the whole 10,000 steps a day thing. That was based yeah, off of hope. some marketing thing in Japan. It had nothing to do with heart disease. Yeah. So, yeah, like, I'll, what really yeah. is the optimal? If you were going to walk every day, uh-huh. what does that? What what gives you a clinically significant outcome on walking? Yeah, I don't know. We don't know. And yeah, I don't know. And where did where the genes in the whole thing? I mean, where does right? The, yeah, where's the, the where's genetics? the genetics? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, and yeah. and like so. sorting through all of those things is where big data seems like it has a lot of promise, but then you have to have that in a database, right? Which is, you have to have information. So, so generally when I get down this line and I'm like, if, but it could be solved, we could do this. I always like somebody in the back of my head goes, and what happens with privacy? You know, like the, the, the civil <laughs> liberties and the privacy and like trusting, I mean, again, just in the news, uh, privacy is not the strong suit of really any of these companies because everyone sees the data and says, but you know, to store this and to use it, we have Mm -hmm. to make money. The only way to make money at the moment for those companies is to say, to sell the information to another company, which isn't really de-identified. And you can find out again with the same big data set, we can tell exactly from a single purchase on the internet that it was you versus, Mm -hmm. versus me. They have to really, because the, the amount of data that's been, that's been collected, they really have to try hard not to identify the person. Yeah. You know, because I think that's the that's the challenge is you have all this data and it's almost impossible not to divulge the information because, yeah. you know, as somebody who is six foot tall and this and that, you, you can explain, yeah. and, but I'm not going to say the name, but we all know who it is, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's um, it's like the literally the elephant in the room, you know. Just, uh, yeah. I mean, that's how I see the data, you know, in the pharmacy and in the healthcare. I mean, same thing, you know. It's, it's uh, there's a lot in place to protect it, but you know, again, you collect so much, yeah, that um, majority of that data becomes useless because you can't really use it, right? Um, in order to protect this privacy, which is fair, you know, yeah. it's, you have to, um, you know, I kind of think of it in terms of like the utopian version of our future and the dystopian view of our free, of our future. So like mm-hmm. in the utopian version of this, of big data and healthcare and our wearable devices and our connected devices that we would have the genetics, you know, we would have done the pharmacogenetic profile and that, mm-hmm. that, one of the sensors or the collection of sensors that I'm using would say, you know, would trigger and say, you know, you, you actually are like your activity is down or your whatever is, is off. You, you're at risk. You're at three times risk for a heart attack. Like maybe it's time mm-hmm. that you need to go in to see a physician and have mm-hmm. this, you know, these, these set things happen because we know that's going to reduce your risk for a heart attack. That's the mm-hmm. utopian version of that, right? And I get an alert that tells me that I need to go see a right. physician because my markers show that I'm at an increased risk for something. Yeah, I mean they're getting there. I mean some some forms of that, be, you know, exist. Yeah, the dystopian yes. view of that though is really horrific, yeah. which is mm-hmm. like I'm applying for a job and they say, yeah, yeah, you're just not a right fit. But really, what that is is because I'm going to cost the insurance too much money. Um, mm-hmm. because I have this risk for whatever disease. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, it's scary uh, and excited at the same time. So yeah. it's it's really trying to figure out that the, the <laughs> medium. I would yeah. love it to be the utopian version, by the way, just for the record, just in case anyone in the future wonders well, which side of the Facebook, fence I'm on. That's what Facebook was all about. It was all about friends getting together, but all of a sudden it's uh, it's this big machine that just yeah. collects data. So it, it all start, you can start as, as a good thing, um, and it potentially could be a good thing. But, you know, th to me, it just has to evolve. If it gets stuck in one then it's going to be abused. It just has to keep going and growing. So, right. Well, Matt, I think we we had a really good conversation. Um, thank you for uh, for sharing everything. Um, we can probably talk for another couple hours, but sure. I think all our batteries are going to die by, by the time we by the time we finish. <laughs> we won't have anything recorded. So. Um, Yes, we'll we'll keep in touch, and um, everybody else. Thank you for for listening. Drugs and coffee, episode two. Um, if you liked it, um, or you, if you didn't like it, just comment, um, subscribe. Please comment on anything we said. And if we said anything stupid, please correct us. Um, that's the nature of the show, and that's the nature <laughs> of healthcare. Really, that's how we learn. Um, so, Matt, thank you again, yeah. and uh, uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.